Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, you have instructed the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that through the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and rejoice in your consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. St. Francis de Sales, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, welcome to our second section, uh, the second session on the introduction. The first part of the introduction, we looked at the historical aspects, foundations of the Bible. We looked at um, the story of Abraham, the history, his movement, we saw the movement of Exodus, we saw the establishment of the king, kingdoms, we saw the, about the divisions of the kingdom, we saw the Palestine at the time of Jesus. Um, so it was more a, a presentation that was historical in its setting. Today we want to talk about uh, the Word of God in itself, how to interpret the Word of God, what is the Word of God, what do you mean by inspiration, what do you mean by inerrancy, what do, you, what do we understand by the Word of God as giving life to our soul? Very good. So let us, uh, united in the Spirit, try to understand these fundamental notions regarding the Word of God. The term Word of God, you hear it in many contexts, it can have two meanings. It can stand for two distinct realities. First one, it can stand for the written word of God. And after reading uh, the whatever from the Bible, the, during the liturgy, you hear people saying, this is a word of God. And we say, thanks be to God. That means the written word of God. But the second meaning, uh, uh, a more original meaning, is the eternal word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and word was God, St. John says. So, eternal word of God, one who was with God and what is still with God. Eternal word of God, the written word of God and the eternal word of God. Now, is there any relationship between the written word of God and the eternal word of God? Yes, the answer is yes. The written word and the eternal word are closely connected. Who connects the two? Christ. Because Christ is the eternal word of God made flesh, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the eternal word of God, praise be uh, And it is the same Christ who speaks in the scripture, divine the scripture, speaks, speaks in the scripture. And the scripture speaks of Christ. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC stands for the Catechism of the Catholic Church, says this, all sacred scripture is but one book and this one book is Christ because all divine scripture speaks of Christ and all divine scripture is fulfilled by, by in Christ. It is fulfilled in Christ and it speaks of Christ. Fulfilling Christ and it speaks of Christ. Very good. Now um, uh, let us proceed. Uh, looking at the next question, uh, the question of inspiration and inerrancy, inspiration and in inerrancy. The question of what authority do we give to the scriptures? Uh, and that question is very pertinent. If I say the scripture is the word of God, then I would treat in one way. If I say the scripture is, uh, is the words of Peter or Paul or James or uh, Moses, uh, and not really word of God, words of human beings, then I would give it another uh, authority or another, it would have another meaning, power over me. Just like uh, how we view things, whether it is a check or advert or news report or prescription, really matters. If I <clears throat> view these things as having authority, as speaking the truth, then I would treat it in one way. And if not, I would treat it in another way. Now, what does the word of God, or the Saint Paul in 2 Timothy, say about the word of God? 
He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, that means to correct people, reproof, for correction, reproof of correction, and for training in righteousness. What is this training in righteousness? Training in right thinking, right doing, right relationship, right worship. We learn how to do things rightly, justly, from or by studying the word of God. So the word of God, if you take it as truly inspired by, by God, and it is without error, then we would treat the word of God with utmost respect. Now, uh, what does it mean to say the word of God is inspired? Uh, inspired, inspiration means breathing. In means within. Inspired means is someone is breathing within you. Because breathing, breath is life. But there is another life within that person, divine life. And who is that? The Holy Spirit breathes forth or speaks to in the person, inspired within the person, and he speaks to that person things to be written down. About what? About matters of faith, and this is important, matters of faith and morals. Faith means what we are to call to believe, the truth, morals, how we are to live, to do things, and facts and events connected with our salvation history. Uh, these things are inherent. There is no error. Why? God cannot lie. If, if it is God's word, then we cannot expect God to teach us lies or tell us lies. He is truth. So all that is there relating to matters of faith, morals, facts and events of salvation history are accurately presented in the sacred scripture. Yet, being, it is also written by the human beings. Human beings were instruments, while God, the Holy Spirit, is the principal agent or order. Now, because human beings are active, what they would write about matters other than faith and morals, you know, facts and events of salvation history, would be colored by what they know and how things appear. Well, the authors wrote uh, according to the ways things appear to their senses. For example, uh, you might have heard about um, uh, Galileo and he's saying the world is round and uh, uh, people who say the church mistook, the church uh, uh, punished him. But the fact is this, the yes, it is true, the early books of the Bible Things that the world is a flat thing, a floating, the earth is a, the land is a flat thing, floating over the waters. So waters surround the land. Well, if you are on a seashore and look at the sea, and it uh, looks exactly like that, as the land floating over the waters. But today we know that is not the case. Now, uh, when Galileo or a scientist of that sort said things that are factually true, physically true, chemically true, geographically true, and where the Bible could have, got, the writer of the Bible could have made errors. Why did he make errors? Because that is how things appear to them. And why did God allow him to make such errors? Well, God's purpose was not to teach us chemistry, biology, history, physics, uh, botany, no, no, those are uh, not God's purpose. God wanted us to reach Him through the, the Word of God, to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, and to be with Him. That is the purpose for which the scriptures were written. So, God did not inspire the Bible, or God could not communicate through the written word in order to give us some information that was not the purpose of God communicating. It was not for just for information of motivation, but it was to save us, that we may come to know him, to love him, to serve him, that we, he may, through the word, he may lead us to faith, he may lead us to hope, and he may lead us to charity, you know, these three are the theological virtues. 
the foundational virtues. Without these qualities within the person, faith, hope, and charity, that person cannot be saved. No one can be saved because it is faith, hope, and charity that brings us to communion with him. Faith, we believe in God. It is directed towards God. Hope is hope in God. Charity, love of God, you see, all are objectively connected to or the object of each of them, faith, hope, and charity is God. And therefore, when we grow in faith, hope, and charity, we are saved. Hence, the purpose of the word of God uh, is to save us. And when God communicates, uh, or com he can communicate in different styles. For example, he can com come down to us. Imagine a parent, uh, who, and he has a child of six, seven, eight years. How does the parent teach the child, communicate to the child? Sometimes the parent comes to the level of the child, begins to play with him, joke with him, uh, caress him. He condescends, con means uh, with, descend, comes down to be with. And many times we see God speaking to us, communicating to us in our human fashion, with our human categories, with our human emotions. But at the same time, just like a parent who at times do not condescend, but raises the child to where he is, where he is. He wants the child to do something which is difficult. He wants the child to read some letters. He wants the child to lift something uh, that is essential. Now, or to take food. So the parent might demand, elevates, lifts the child up. Similarly, some of the writings on the scriptures is intended to raise us from our level. Uh, a good educator is someone who comes down to the level of the people, but then does not stay there. Then lift that people to where he is by teaching him, by forming him. Similarly, God comes down to us and then he raises up to where he is. That is the purpose of the scriptures. Now, um, about interpreting the scriptures. How are we expected to interpret the scriptures? What are the rules uh, or criteria that we need to keep in mind to interpret the scriptures? Now, the, the first criteria that is that we must be uh, attentive to the content of the word of God and the unity of the whole scripture. What is the content? We already said the content of the script, written scripture is not physics, chemistry, biology. No, the content is faith, morals, and the truths about our, the history of our salvation. That is the content. Be attentive to that. Then unity. Who is the one who provides unity to the whole scripture? God himself. It is the it is the word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it is the word which speaks of Christ, which is fulfilled in Christ. So the unity is, is provided by the person of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we must be attentive to that, the content and the unity. Don't get distracted because of... Um, uh, some funny tale there or some descriptions which make us uh, laugh or some uh, uh, so-called demands of God to avenge many times. Don't get distracted. Be attentive to the content and the unity of the whole scripture. Second rule is that we must interpret the scripture within the living tradition of the church. Living tradition. Tradition means uh, handed over. What is handed over from one generation to the next. And this tradition develops within the church. It is alive, uh, the tradition. The church keeps it alive. Of whom, whom did we get these traditions or tradition in the church? We started first from the apostles, then the fathers, the great leaders who came after the apostles, the apostolic fathers, the Nicene fathers, the post-Nicene fathers, the great saints of the church, the doctors of the church, the councils of the church, the great popes in the church who taught, they all belong to that tradition 
living tradition because what this person taught was is connected to the previous one so this person makes it alive the sacred scripture must then be read in the living tradition um, as a result when we have doubts about certain passages or, or within the scripture what do we do we did not imagine what is the right interpretation we go to the church and ask what is the interpretation of this passage? Because the church is supposed to know the interpretation because it has been handed over to the church. Let me give you a simple example. You read the, in the Gospels that Jesus had brothers and sisters, other brothers and sisters. And in fact, they are also named in the, in the Gospels. You know their names, brothers and sisters. Now, the term brother, sister can be interpreted in different ways. There is a blood brother, meaning the children of the same parent, mother, father, or then there are relations like cousins, brother, you can call them by friendship, affinity, uh, you call a friend my brother, or brother because you all belong to a particular group, a particular family, or particular nation, particular culture, particular tribe. So all these contexts we use uh, often the term brother. Therefore, the brother has different meanings. Now, what is the right meaning that we should apply when we hear the word brother in reference to the brothers and sisters of Jesus? And uh, we, we do not know initially. We might have doubts, so we ask the church. What does the church say? So in the church, we have the great fathers, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, uh, and others. How did they interpret that passage? And all of them interpreted those passages, not as real blood, but in other words, they didn't say they are other children of Mary or Joseph. No, no, no. Did they say they are brothers only by this affection, friendship? No, 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 no. Did they say they are brothers because they belong to the same uh, ethnic group, Jewish? No. So what did they mean? They said they are cousins. They are relations, close relations of Jesus, brothers of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, but not Mary's ch children. Mary did not have children, any other children. That we come to know from the living tradition. Here there is a big difference between how we Catholics interpret the word of God and how many of the Protestant brothers and sisters interpret. When you and I, we, we have to interpret the word of God, we ask the church, we refer to the church, we refer to the council, we refer to the fathers of the church, we refer to the popes and their teachings, and from there we come to know the right interpretation. But our brothers, um, who do not, who do not, may not have such a assistance, they will try to imagine what the interpretation is. That is how, after the Protestant Reformation, we have had so many Christian communities being uh, born simply because the interpretation of one differed from the interpretation of other, and there was no one they could refer to. So Luther would in, interpret in one way, Calvin would interpret in another way, Zwingli, these are the great uh, founders of the Protestant Reformation, Zwingli would re interpret in another way when they hear about Jesus, the bread of life, the Eucharist, or when they hear about praying for the dead, when they hear about the judgment. The interpretation varied, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, today we see how that has affected in the splintering of the church, the one church into thousands and thousands of groups. Because there was no tradition. Tradition was rejected by the founders of the Protestant Reformation. The third is that we must be attentive to the analogy of faith. An uh, analogy of faith, in other words, coherence of the truths of faith within the whole plan of salvation. Uh, there is a coherence, there is unity of faith. And what is the core of our faith? Where do you find it? You find it primarily in the creed. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried on the third day, rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophet. I believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Now, that is basically the the summary of our faith. That is a faith that is we that was given to us on the day of our baptism. We were given that faith, and we profess that faith uh, every Sunday when we gather for the liturgy. Now. Everything else must be coherent with that faith. That there is a truth, I mean, there is coherence, there is unity. When, uh, when anything that we hear contradicts or is opposed to what we profess in the creed, then we must know that is a wrong interpretation. So, uh, there are many, for example, uh, there are many places in the, in the Gospels where we see Jesus Humanness, he cries, he weeps, he that says he does not know the hour, etc. And you think Jesus is a human being, therefore he is not God. So when we are tempted to think he is not God, we must say, no, no, that is a wrong interpretation. I, I cannot deny his divinity because the creed clearly teaches me that he is consubstantial with the Father. So these rules are important that we keep this mind, these principles, these criterion, uh, criteria by attentive to the content and unity of the whole scripture. Read the scripture within the living tradition of the church. Be attentive to the analogy of faith, coherence of the truths of faith in the whole of plan of salvation. Then, uh, uh, then we moving forward, we need to know something about the two see senses or meanings of the scripture uh, this is an important thing because our study of the scripture now the word the word of life bible study program that we have begun is intended to help us to understand the literal sense and to a bit also the spiritual sense of the scripture so the word of god has two senses or two meanings According to the tradition of the church, uh, ancient tradition, we must and we can distinguish between two senses. Now, sense is a technical term, this word sense. It basically says the meanings, two senses of scripture, the literal sense and the spiritual sense. Now, what is the literal sense? Literal sense is simply the grammatical meaning that we grasp or the, uh, when we read a particular passage. It is the meaning of the words and expressions used by the biblical authors as they were understood in their original setting and by their original recipients. Uh, Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. Now, uh, when you know who is a Samaritan woman, who is Jesus, and talking, and why there is a, she is surprised, by this man talking to him, when you are understanding all that, you are understanding the literal sense, the words, expressions used by the biblical authors as they were understood in their original setting uh, and in their origin by their original recipients. How did the apostles react when they see Jesus speaking to the Samaritan? And uh, you are surprised. Why did they say that? But once you understand the context, then you will not be surprised that uh, the fact that uh, the apostles, the disciples, were shocked uh, to see him talking to a Samaritan woman. Now, literal sense, therefore, is a meaning that comes out through the uh, passage, use, which you probably uses various figures of speech, such as metaphors, simile, hyperbole, 
uh, linguistic expressions, types of literature, poems, narratives, parables, proverbs, etc. And when you learn, just like in the school you learn literature, when you learn Shakespeare or when you learn an African order uh, and their novels or their pieces of work, you understand the meaning of their metaphors, similes, hyperboles, the types of their language. You understand them better. You deepen their understanding of their mind. Similarly, when we study the scripture, uh, in, uh, in order to grasp a literal sense, we understand better the test of the scripture. Literal sense is the textual meaning, the meaning communicated by that particular test. Now, the literal meaning is important because the spiritual meaning about which I am going to speak uh, immediately now after this is based on the literal and is important it is based on the literal. If I cut away the spiritual meaning which is mostly application from the literal then I would might be imagining myself. The God's Holy Spirit speaks to me through the literal sense of the word of God and not apart from the literal sense. So uh, now uh, li literal sense uh, like Lord is my shepherd. This is shepherd is a metaphor. The day will come like a thief. Like a thief is a simile. The bread of life is a metaphor. And the way, the truth and the life, they are images. They are images. Kingdom of God is a metaphor. Treasure hidden in a field. Notice the use of the term like, meaning simile. You are the salt of the earth. Bible is full of such um, figures of speech and we interpret it as a figure of speech. Sometimes the Bible uses hyperbole or a sort of exaggeration that all from Judea came to see Jesus. Well, the fact is uh, certainly not everybody all will really come. Uh, but we need to say a great number came. When Jesus tells you, if your hand causes you to, to, cut, uh, to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Of course, we don't do it. <laughs> Though we commit many sins with our eyes, with our hands, with our tongue. Why? Because we know that should not be taken literally, but it should be taken as a hyperbole, a style of speaking, a way of speaking. Okay, uh, the literal meaning. Eh? So, literal meaning is a grammatical meaning, the meaning that the author had in mind and what the listeners, hearers at that time understood. Now, what is a spiritual meaning? Spiritual meaning is the meaning that the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to me right now through the Word of God. It is a uh, meaning that the Holy Spirit is telling, giving me. So this is what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us beyond even what the human authors have consciously asserted. The spiritual sense disclosed deeper, and to, it reveals deeper the mysteries, what is a mystery, the divine revelation, and uh, which are communicated through historical realities. It helps us to deepen uh, and this image is a very good image to understand the connection between literal sense and uh, spiritual sense. What is the connection between the soul and the body? Body is a material dimension, soul is the spiritual dimension of the person, but the person is one. There is no body without the soul and there is no human soul without the body. Uh, they are always united, it is only in death, it is, uh, it is uh, separated for some time. Now, uh, 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 the soul animates the body, gives life to the body, and the body embodies the soul. Similarly, the literal sense is animated by the spiritual sense, and the spiritual sense embodies, covers, gives flesh to the, the literal sense. So, what the soul is to the body the spiritual sense are uh, to the literal sense. Now, uh, again, one more, we have to take one more step. The spiritual sense may be subdivided into three. The spiritual sense may be further be subdivided into three. 
one allegorical sense second moral sense third anagogical sense it is easy to distinguish the three if you are able to connect them with faith hope hope is here and love faith hope and love and love sorry we are able to connect with faith hope and love the allegorical sense deepens our faith the anagogical sense deepens our hope and the moral sense deepens our love in other words we grow in faith hope and love when we allow the holy spirit to communicate to us the spiritual meaning through the literal meaning allegorical understanding the events by recognizing their significance in christ moral understanding what i am expected to do now what is the most loving thing to do now anagogical is i see my 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 life in terms of the future where the lord is leading me so realities and events are viewed in terms of their eternal significance hope i want to give you a small uh, example here uh, you are familiar with the parable of jesus when uh, jesus was when uh, jesus was asked this question uh, who is my uh, what must i do to inherit the kingdom the young man eh? and jesus said you know uh, the commandments uh, love your god with all your heart and then the young man was anxious to justify himself and said to jesus now tell me who is my neighbor and in answer jesus said a man was once on his way down from jerusalem to jericho and fell into the hands of the bandits and they stripped him beat him and made off leaving him half dead now a priest happened to be traveling down the same road but when he saw the man he passed by on the other side in the same way a levite who came to the place uh, saw him and passed on the other side but a samaritan traveler who came on him and was moved with compassion when he saw him he went up to him bandaged his wounds poured oil and wine on them he then lifted him on to his own mount and took him to an inn and looked after him next day he took out two denarii and handed them to the innkeeper and said look after him on my way back i will make good any extra expense which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor to the man who fell into the bandit's hands and the response the one who showed pity jesus said go and do the same yourself now literal meaning is a meaning that now is coming to your mind you know jerusalem uh, uh, the, the temple where god is worshiped you know jericho down at the valley when you are able to connect this jerusalem and jericho and imagine a person walking from jerusalem to jericho the um, road is uh, uh, is abandoned uh, there are very few people on the road and it's so normal for the person to fall into bandits and then uh, he is left for dead and uh, and finally who is a samaritan who is a neighbor surely it is a samaritan who saw this man wounded who he acted as a good neighbor and you understood well, that is the literal meaning now spiritual meaning is the meaning that helps you to strengthen your faith or your hope and or your love now let me give you uh, uh, how one of the great fathers of the church origin interpreted this spiritually not literally but spiritually the literal meaning he said jerusalem uh, what is jerusalem standing for jerusalem uh, this one jerusalem is nothing else but heaven paradise and jericho is hell who is the one who came out of jerusalem paradise and was on the way to hell adam so it is a story of adam adam coming out of paradise and then he fell into the into the hands of the bandits who are these devils satan and his angels and they stripped him beat him left him 
You see, he is there on the road, poor Adam. Now God pity, took pity on him. He sent a priest and then uh, a Levite. What is, uh, who are these priests and the Levite? They stand for the assistance God gave through the Old Testament. Te pre teachers, preachers, priests, prophets. Uh, the temple, uh, all that, the assistance. But they only saw him, they passed on the other side. Now comes the Samaritan. Who is the Samaritan? Christ. Christ is a Samaritan. He is, he is uh, God and man. He had compassion on this. He comes down. Christ comes from heaven. And he compassion on him. And he went. He took him up, bandaged, washed his wounds, bandaged his wounds, washed his wounds. What is that? Pouring oil. What is oil? And the wine. And took him. This stands for the sacraments. Baptism, our wounds are washed clean. Oil, conf confirmation, and wine, the Eucharistic wine. And then he takes us uh, to uh, and puts him in the inn which is the in the church, where we are supposed to grow healthy. In the church, we are still fed and we are taken care of. And the church, the pastors, they take care of us. And one day the Lord will come back and then he will find us healthy. So uh, this is now an allegorical interpretation. This passage is interpreted in the light of what has happened in the history of our salvation? How Adam sinned, came out of paradise, the Old Testament, God chose and made them a nation, gave them priests, prophets, temple, everything, but they did not help them. So God Himself comes and He takes care of Him, He washes Him in the baptism, He anoints Him in the Eucharist, uh, sorry, in the confirmation, He feeds Him in the Eucharist, puts Him in the church. And in the church, he is fed by the word and the sacraments until the Lord returns. That is when he will die. That is the day the Lord will return. Now, that interpretation is allegorical interpretation. Another one can interpret morally. You can say, look at my people. Look at my, I am here and I have, I am, uh, I have a neighbor. And the, the, the boy there has not gone to school because their parents cannot afford. And maybe I need to help him. And the person is moved with compassion and he helps him. And that is now the moral meaning. What is the most loving action that I must do here and now? A priest giving a homily might remind the Christians in his parish that there are quite a few people who have difficulty in uh, having their daily food. There are elderly people who are no one to take care of. There are children who have only one meal because they cannot afford, the parents cannot afford another one. And we need to do something. Let us assist, let us help. Now, that is a moral meaning. Now, what is the anagogical meaning? Anagogical meaning is to feed your hope. Uh, so, when you look at this reading, imagine you are a catechist and or you are a, a pastoral minister. You are doing some service in the church. But you, get, you are discouraged because people are not responding to you well. And they are criticizing you. They are not appreciating you. You want to give up. But then you read this passage and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and uh, uh, highlighted these words. Uh, Look after him, and on my way back, I will make good any extra expense you have. Look after him on my way back. And suddenly the Holy Spirit rem reminds you, remember, you are doing all this, not simply for these people. You are doing all this for me, that the Lord Jesus, and the Lord will return and reward you. These people may not reward you because they are human beings, but God will reward you. He will return. For everything that you suffered, he will reward you. And that now the catechist is uh, encouraged. The, the one who carries out such a ministry is encouraged. And he goes home enthusiastic, uh, now willing to commit himself. 
Now that is the anagogical meaning that is coming out from that passage. So I repeat the three meanings, spiritual meanings, allegorical, which is intended to feed our faith, to strengthen our faith on things that already happened, always happening. Second, uh, moral meaning is to strengthen my love, uh, my love here and now. What is the most loving action to do here? And the moral meaning, spirit tells me that. Anagogical meaning is to strengthen my hope. Now, that way, this word of God can communicate to us and should communicate to us spiritually. And this is why we need to pray, learn to pray with the word of God. Uh, we need to use the word of God both for prayer as well as to study. Now, our, we are doing uh, studies, but you will take the word of God and use it for prayer. Uh, last class, sister taught you about uh, Lexio Divina, and she sent you the notes of Lexio Divina. Uh, uh, to pray with uh, scripture is nothing else but Lexio Divina. So we must be disciplined. We must have a rhythm of praying with the word of God. Uh, let us say, every day I will read a, pa a passage. Every day I am going to read a chapter. Uh, and uh, one after chapter and then after reading and rereading that chapter that passage again and again and i will meditate reflect about it and i will try to apply it to my own life the spiritual meaning right now and i will pray about it now that is that is using the bible in the right way that the spirit wanted us to use for our interior life for our study so we are approaching the word of God. Let us not forget us as we come closer to the word of God. The word of God, the eternal word of God has been approaching us even before we were born. Uh, it is like the two lovers moving towards one another. I, my heart is moved by love towards the word of God. And the word of God, Christ himself is moving towards me. In fact, it is he through the spirit who planted that love so that I may move towards him. He has been from eternity moving towards me, wanting to make my heart his home, wanting to be fully united with me. God created us for himself to be united with him. God did not create it for our spouses, eh? for our children. Yes, we have to love them in this world, our spouses. But first reason why God created me is for himself. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. So that is a movement towards God. And thank God because God has planted this love in your heart to spend every week two hours studying with me and as a group the word of God. And every day spending some time reading, reflecting, and praying with the word of God. That love in your heart, belief, brothers and sisters, has been planted by the Holy Spirit. The, and that was because Jesus, the word of God, wants to unite himself with you to truly become flesh, uh, like he became flesh in Mary's uh, womb and in her heart. So to the word of God, Jesus wants to become flesh. Last class, sister spoke to us about how to pray with the word of God. Uh, he spoke the Lexio. These are four uh, Latin terms. Lexio meaning reading. Read the word of God. Take a passage. Maybe the passage of that day that is to be used for Mass. Or maybe a chapter of the Bible that you are reading the Mark's Gospel continuously. You are taking one chapter a day and you are reading that chapter again and again and again or a section of the chapter again and again and again asking questions who said it what was said when was said where was it said even using fantasy lexio reading and reflecting meditatio is meditation reflecting uh, learning to ask questions meditation is in order to understand deeper what i am reading in other words to grasp the literal meaning of the text meditation and when i read i uh, oppose i begin to also connect it to my own life in other words uh, i begin to discover the spiritual meaning vis-a-vis -vis my life of faith my life of hope 
and my life of love, faith, hope, and love. And whatever new thoughts now have come in me, or whatever connections I have discovered, I now use it in prayer, or ratio means to pray. I pray with them. I pray, I speak to the Lord about what he was, what was moving me. I speak to the Lord what has what is happening to me. And after that, contemplation is to stay in silence. And in that silence, it is God who takes us out of where we are and makes grants us certain experiences, otherwise we would not even have dreamt of. Now, uh, uh, contemplation is purely God's gift. And God may not give that gift every day. He may give it to some people very often, some other people rarely. So do not be upset. It is God. God alone knows the reason why some people, within a short time, they are, be, they are able to enter into a state of contemplation where they are totally fully in God. God has caught their senses and their senses, interior senses, are fully absorbed in God. While others, they will have to struggle for years and years with the Lectio Meditatio and Oratio, the other three. But God's, God's ways are the best. We accept whatever God is going to do with our soul, uh, with our faculties. But remember, we must pray with the scriptures in this form of Lectio Divina. Read meditate, think, reflect, uh, know the literal and the spiritual meaning, pray with it, pray especially uh, uh, what the spiritual meaning has come, dawned on to you, then stay in silence, contemplation, in silence, awaiting, awaiting God to speak to you much more audibly, speak Lord, your servant is listening, speak Lord, your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, when Sister spoke, she also said about the fifth stage, that is a mission. Well, that is a stage. In other words, our meditation must have an effect on our life, on our life of service, on our life with others. So, Lectio, Lectio reading, Meditatio, deepening understanding, both the literal and the spiritual understanding, or ratio, using it for prayer, the thoughts, contemplation, staying in love, and the mission is service to others. Service to others. Uh, we do not close ourselves in a world of our own. We pray also to be a good servant to others. The best gift that we can give to our children, our families, is a gift of holiness. The best gift that I can give to my community, my church, is a gift of holiness. So I grow in holiness so that I may become God-like, Christ-like in my life with my brothers and sisters. The great Saint John of the Cross is a, uh, is a great saint, a doctor of the church who lived in the 15th century. He wrote, seek in lexio, seek in reading, and you will find in meditatio, no kino ratio, you will enter into contemplatio. Uh, that is, keep reading the word of God, keep reading, reflecting, and then uh, keep asking him for the grace of discovering him better. And then you will be given that grace. And that, you, that way you will enter into the life of God. So keep these things in your mind as we proceed with our study. The next time when you come, we shall be studying the Gospel of Mark. So with this, we complete the introductory part. Introductory part. After the introduction, we shall begin the Gospel of Mark. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was at the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this experience. We thank you for teaching us your word. May your word always take root in our hearts. And may we always love your word, read the word, study the word, pray with the word, and be transformed by the word. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.